heart man. Somebody say Pura. You know, when we were there at the Men of Valor, that was an essence that they were focusing in on. The men and the women that have taken this ministry for the last 50 years forward have done it with their Pura, with their heart. People with heart can do amazing things, amen? Especially when they give their heart to God. See, there's the, there's the supernatural power is when God comes into the heart of a man or a woman. Because you've got heart. If you, if you made it through the community and the family that you've been part of, you had to have heart to make it through there. But when you give your heart to the Lord and He begins to use you, something, something in the supernatural begins to unfold, and you begin to see miracles in the lives of other people. And in your name, amen. amen. I don't know about you, but I'm not a very good church guy. I'm in church, you know, I mean, just going to church, that would turn me off. I'd be all burned out quick, you know, a couple of months of that. I'd have to go do crime or something. But to see God do miracles in people's lives really got a hold of my heart. It really changed the way... You know, that I see uh, the kingdom of God when I begin to see people being delivered, their heart, broken hearted people being restored, and marriages being restored, families, you know, men that uh, their lives are all tore up, and then next you know they're leading a family, they're leading a uh, family into the future and being the strength of that family. And of course, this is Mother's Day, and so my heart, you know, I look at me and my wife's story because that's very personal to me. And I think about a woman, how many of you know that when uh, me and Sister Rosina met, we were all messed up. Our lives were all messed up. But there was one thing that I recognized in her, is that she had heart. You know? She had God you know? And I, I, I witnessed it right away. I've seen her knock some chick smooth out on the street, talking stuff to her. And I go, I like that girl right there. I like her. You know? I like that. You know, I like somebody that has heart. Because I wasn't going to give my life to somebody that was a wimp, hello. Somebody that didn't, didn't, didn't have no fight in them or didn't have no substance. They had to have some character, some fight. Or I, they weren't getting my heart. Hello. Hello. And the same thing, I imagine she was looking at me, examining me to see what I was all about. And uh, the two come together. The Bible says this, two cannot walk together and listen to you. And so we had to agree on a lot of things and some things we didn't agree on, but one thing we did agree on is that we were two unique people that God was bringing together and I was recognizing that there was a woman, I wanted her in my life, and then because she gave me the, her youth, come on somebody, she gave me her youth, it's not like we've been together a few months or a few years, uh, she was 22 and I was 27 when we met. And we've been together since then, hello. And so, yeah, so I really have high esteem for her. And I, you know, I appreciate that she would give her life to me. And you know what I mean? And stick with me through everything, thick and thin, ups and downs, all around, you know, stones of life, whatever. And I honor that so much. I just, you know, I tell her. I ain't going nowhere, girl. I ain't not leaving your side till Jed do me part. And then, you know, she says, what about when we get up there? But, and I said, I don't know that part yet. I ain't been up there yet. We'll figure that one out when we get there. But I know one thing for sure. There's no one like a mother. There's no one, I, I mean, you know, a mother's love is so deep and so wide. So, you know, embraces so many different people. Because every child is different. Hello? Every child. And then when the grandchildren start coming, oh man, you got some characters there too, you know? Some bosses, some, what do they call them? Beast, and what do they call their women that are, like they think they boss the whole world? Queen bees? Oh, you get these little mini queen bees that show up. Man, they start calling shots right away, you know. And then you got the guys, you get these little grandsons, and man, they're, they're a trip. You can see, you can tell right away that they're very different. That they're, very, they're like geniuses 
their mind's always going, they're always trying to manipulate you and take control, and then all of a sudden, here comes mama, here comes grandma, she puts them in check. Boom! They cry. <laughs> they get all, they get all jacked up. But the kids, the kids and the love that a mother has, that heart that she has, because she doesn't just give it to her own children, she gives it to other people's children too. Can I hear an amen? Now, my wife was just in my office and, and Johnny was giving her his story and, and she was about ready to bust out in tears. She was hugging him, oh my hito, oh my hito. And I'm like, Jim, and I'm like, man, man this chick, she's just got this heart. A mother's heart, it amazes me. And I have a mother. Come on, y'all have a mother. If you didn't have a mother, you wouldn't be here. But I had a mother, and my mother was a chip because she instilled something in me that gave me confidence in the face of the world. I knew she was always in my corner. I love her. I know she never gave up on me. I know it took her about 39 years to finally have a reason to tell me she was proud of me. Come on. But when I heard them words, they were still very beautiful words to hear. But I knew that she loved me, I knew that she was in my corner, and I knew that she was, uh, she would never give up on me. And I see that in my wife, I see that very same traits. I think they were so attractive to me, is that she was that kind of, of a woman, that she loved her children, she would never give up on them. She was going to fight for them, do whatever she had to do for her family. And this is something that I wanted instilled into my daughters. I wanted them to have that same kind of heart. To know that a family is a family is a family. And then, no matter what they go through, because they're going to go through a bunch of things. But that there has to be the people in the family that are the, the solid foundational kind of people. That they're the Christ-like people. They're the ones that don't crumble when the going gets tough. They're not, they don't fall apart. They're not sand people. They're rock people. You know, they're solid, solid. And this is what's so critical to our culture. The women of our culture are very important. They're so special to us. We, I grew up in a community where you don't talk about no one's mama. If you talk about somebody's mama, you're going to get sobbed. And you know it. You just feel like getting sucked that day? Talk about someone's mama, and you're going to get sucked. And it's just the way it is. And you might not even get sucked from the person you're talking about their mama. One of their friends may sock you, and she's taking care of him too. Hello, somebody. I mean, we, we come from communities where women are very dominant figures in the social order of our families. They have a lot of pull, they have a lot of say. Uh, and so I know that when I talk to you today from the Word of God, because I'm going to take you into the book of 1 Timothy, and I want you to kind of get the gist of what God is saying to His people in regards to the way that we treat the women and the men in our family, but specifically the women. But I'm going to ask you uh, in this one portion of scripture I'm going to begin to read in. You're going to indulge me a little bit because uh, I want to start in verse 1 of chapter 5 in the book of First Timothy. Now it reads like this. Do not rebuke an older man harshly. I'll be talking stuff to Mingo. I'll be talking stuff to Dale. You're talking stuff the best. Don't talk to older men harshly. You should have a, re a respectability to yourself. If you think that you're only points by getting jazzy with an older man, you're not. You're looking stupid. You're looking lame. You're looking like you have no upbringing. You look like you have no class. You have no finesse. Like you're, 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 like you're kind of a, a messed up individual. You need a hat with an R on it so that we can recognize you in the crowd. That we don't snap judge you, but that we know that you got brain damage or something. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers. What? Treat younger men as brothers. That's pretty cool. Because you know, I should come with my brothers. 
Well, that's a thump with my brothers. My brothers used to tie me to a pole. They said, Johnny, you want to play Indians? And they'd tie me to a pole and they'd say, you're stuck like Chuck and we're going downtown and you can't go with us. You're too little. Come on. So brothers, you can kind of get away with more. You could be playing football and sock each other. And, you know, you could do all that. Body slam each other. Good one, good one, bro. You can play that. Don't play that with older guys. It don't look good on you. It don't look good when you try to move on an older man. You should have respect for the older men. It says for younger men as brothers, younger women, or older women as mothers. Come on. You say, don't talk about my mama. And treat all the older women in that same category like if they were your mama. Treat them right. Treat them with respect. We don't hold the door open for them. How do carry the packages? Don't see an older woman carrying something into the church and walk away. You should be right there. You know, like my grandson Josiah, he was in training and he used to go places. And some of you who've seen him, you know, he's a pretty good guy. And so we pull up like dollar store, 7-Eleven. That was one of his favorite stops. But when we'd see an older woman carrying anything, I would sick him on her. I'd go, go away. And then he'd go over there, he'd hold the door for her, he'd carry her stuff, he'd walk her to her car. And at first when he'd come up to them, they would be like, oh my goodness, this kid's going to roll me up and rob me. But when he would take, treat them as a woman, when he'd treat them with respect and hold things for them, carry help them, they would look at him like, you're a new, unique kid. I really appreciate that you're in my community, bro. And he walks back to the car with that little swagger, like, I did good, huh, Grandpa? I did good. So, yeah, I did good, I did good. You know, it was like, here, go buy some hot Cheetos and a, and a Gatorade or a tea or whatever. But it was like, I was training him the way I was trained in, in my neighborhood. I was training him to be a gentleman. Hello. A gentleman is very critical, especially when you're dealing with women, because women respect that attribute in a man. They, they don't want to see a guy that's a bulldog. Come on, go bulldog your brother. Go bulldog your woman. I remember when I first came into the church, uh, the pastor used to say, if you hit your old lady, you're a coward. And I would be sitting there and I'd be like, I'm going to hit you, dude. I ain't a coward, but I had crossed some lines in my life. Hello, somebody. Come on. I don't know about you, but I crossed lines in my life, especially when I was in heavy into drugs and alcohol, and I started losing my weight, and I started behaving in a wrong fashion. And uh, then when you come back to your senses, and God begins to bring you back to your senses, Sometimes you're embarrassed at your behavior and you don't even want to admit it was wrong, but it was wrong. Come on. It was wrong. It was wrong whenever a man bulldogs a woman. Let me say it loud. It's, it's wrong whenever a man bulldogs a woman. And because we're not designed the same. Even though my old lady, you know, she was tough and everything like that, she can whoop me. She can't whoop me then, she can't whoop me now. But it was just the point that she's the weaker sex, and so I have no, I shouldn't have to move on her. I should be able to treat her with respect. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I, remember, I remember one time, not too long ago, well, you know, it might be a few years, but for me it was not that long ago, but I was talking and I was trying to get her attention and I went like this and I hit her arm. I went, bam, and I hit her arm. She said, don't be hit with me, I'll call the cops. Because <laughs> I always tell the women, if your old man hits you, call the cops. Well, I don't call the cops. I know we don't. We don't call the cops because we're thugs. We don't call the cops. But, but when you're a Christian, you need to draw some lines in your household. And you need to start saying, hey, dude, when you're a thug, you might stand me around. But now we're Christians, you don't put your hands on me. If you put your hands on me and call the boys in blue, they'll put their hands on you. <laughs> I may not even be able to beat you down, but you know that boys will have you all over the site. 
to have you crying for your mama. But the thing is this, that when we get this principles of God and we bring in the respectability and we say, well, older women, okay, I should treat them like, like they're my mom. I should treat them with respect and dignity and listen to them and care about them. And then the younger women, I should treat them like they're my sisters. Come on, unless you're like warped mentality. You shouldn't be trying to scheme on your sister. Come on, somebody. Some people think the church is the dating game. The love ship. That ain't what it was about. It was about serving God. Amen? And God hooked you up with a beautiful moment that you to carry for you. That's great. But when you're just playing the dating game, you know, you don't really don't care about that chick. You don't care about her salvation. You don't care about her family. You don't care about nothing but satisfying your own fleshly desires. That's about as bunk as you can get in the church. Now, how many of you know that? You ought to start off like that. You come into the church, we ain't all there. We're like tripping. We don't even know what we're doing there. And then God starts changing us and maturing us and putting his principles in us, then we begin to make decisions differently. We start behaving differently. We start having some finesse. We start having a little class. We start having a little, you know, come on somebody. You know, we start representing Christ. And all of a sudden women start feeling safe around you because you're not, you don't worry about you because you're not trying to get on a home. You know, we've been in the ministry a long time, so we've seen every kind of situation you can think of. If you can dream of it, we've probably seen it. We see women that just come in after the men in the home. They come in, they throw their stiletto leg out there, and they go, na 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 We're over here going, oh my God, oh my Lord, and they're going, na 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 And then the man looks over, at him and he goes, I got to get a job. I'm going to get out of here. I to they say, Jesus, get out of the way. You ain't nobody. Come on. And then they go after Fulana. How many of you know you're not the first one on our chopping blocks? throw you out like an old diaper. And then you'll be back at the men's home knocking at the door. <laughs> and we don't go, oh, you can't come in. You made a mistake. We just go, come on. Yeah. I have a problem of women. We go like this. Close your eyes. Okay, open them. <laughs> you'll be all right for a couple of days. The thing is that we're only human beings and we deal with the same problems. Every man, every woman, we deal with the same thing. We know that there's a progression. We know that you're going to have them complications. You're going to get through it. You know? You're going amen? Amen. to get, you're gonna go through that and then you're going to outgrow that and then pretty soon you're going to have a woman on your arm and she's going to like trust you. She's not going to be kind to you. You went to the 7-Eleven at 12 through 8, boy. And you're barely getting back now at 12, 22? It doesn't take that long. You know, you get to a point where, you know, like the men of God that went to the conference, look at our women, let us go. They, uh, they trusted us that we were going to go up there and do the things of God, that we weren't going to be over there running the mud and acting crazy. And uh, they said, well, mature, you know, to a point where you can trust them. And this is important in a relationship. This is important to the women. Today is Mother's Day, and we want to, re we want to recognize that women have certain expectations from men, especially if a woman's going to give you her life. Hello? She expects you to value that. 
In the world, we really don't because we're not all there. We're like, we're doofy out there in the world. We're, we're, we're under the wrong direction. We have the wrong coaches, we have the wrong advisors. We just have everything wrong about it. And we're trying to make it right, and it doesn't work out right. There's a lot of heartache, there's a lot of families that break up and then faces. There's a lot of couples that they actually really love each other, they just hurt each other so bad, they can't stand each other's mode no more. They can't even look at each other without wanting to go to blows again, because all the hurt comes back. So when we come in the kingdom of God, we want to structure things where uh, people have a future and they have a hope that God can really do something awesome in their family. And it takes trust, it takes respect, it takes, you know, behavior that is uh, something that you recognize that that person's character has changed. And so there's a, a stability that's established. And how many of you know when a, when a parent and when a mother and a, a father are in a relationship of love and security like that, it affects the children. The children receive that security and they're more stable and they're more secure and they're more confident because they know that their family structure is going to be intact. Because they trust that God is doing something powerful in their family. Now I want you to read a little bit here with me as we talk, we talk a little bit about that. But now it says this, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. So repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. In other words, when a, when a woman has family, that family should be stepping up to the plate to take care of business for her. Can I hear an amen? When she has an old man, a lot of times he's the one doing it, but if he passes away or something happens or she's alone and she doesn't have him, and then it, the responsibility falls on the children. It even goes down to the grandchildren. And how many of you know it's difficult to handle older people? It's like, they just don't care what you think. They're like, they don't care. You walk in, you're like, I want to see uh, Dancing with the Stars, and they're like, we're watching Lord of the Period. We're watching Andy Griffin. Period. You know what I mean? You don't like it? We're watching this black and white movie, you don't like it? Split. Huh? And make me some, eat up that menudo while you're leaving it. They're like, they don't care. They're like, oh, Jack, with me, I already took care of business. It's your turn now. You take care of business now. So responsibility starts falling on the people, you know, the rest of the family. And uh, a lot of times what they do is they don't want the responsibility. They want the church to take the responsibility. That's not proper. That's not orderly. Now watch this. Oh, no, we're going to get into something. But if a widow has children and grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and their grandparents for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure, uh oh, talking about Fulana, the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even as she lives. Give the people this instruction so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household doesn't provide for their relatives, and especially their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, we're always running into this. I'm going to tell you something. In the complicated families that we're involved in, there's always people that cross them lines. When they cross them lines, we get parents that don't know the Word of God trying to cut them out of the action. Come on, somebody. Now, we... You didn't get advice from other Christians. Just cut them loose. 
cut them loose, cut them loose. Because them Christians don't know the Word of God either. The Word of God tells us that we stick with them. How many of you know blood is thicker than mud? Blood is thicker than water. Blood is still the end. If they're in your family, they're in your family. You don't cut them loose. Where did you get that nonsense from? You're so holy now. You used to be running the project. You used to be out there all night in all the bars. You used to be at all the parties. You used to be borrowing clothes. Your kids were at home alone, and you were out borrowing clothes to look cute at a nightclub so somebody could buy you some drinks and stuff, and then you got saved, and all of a sudden you're all that in a bag of beans. Uh-uh, it don't fly with God. It may fly with the religious people, they don't fly in God's kingdom. That's your baby. You, you stick with that baby. You stick with that baby. You take handle. Are they having complications? Oh. 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 Well, what about when you left them with that babysitter? What about when you left them over there? What about when you left them home alone? Well, that way you never left no kids home alone. I was just running down to the liquor store. Yeah, but you met Chacho and Flacco and you jumped in the car with them and then you went to the party, then you got picked up and they took you to jail and then you come home three days later and your kid's still home alone. But they had enough sense not to call the cops on you? Because you got thug kids too? Come on. We're quick to cut people off when they cause us a lot of complication, when they're hard to deal with. How many of you know you had times in your life when you were hard to deal with? You were hard to deal with. I tell people, my mom comes home and finds her whole house shot to pieces, like Bonnie and Clyde's car. She didn't say, you got to go. I can't handle you. She was like, are you hungry? <laughs> you know what I mean? She just did right into her mother role, like nothing. Oh, I, I washed your socks. You may go put them in the drawer. I mean, they got some holes in them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you have to recognize that just because you became Christian don't make you exempt from the complications of being part of the family that you're a part of. If you're a part of that family, you're a part of that family. If you take the role as the head of that family, as a step up and be the head of the family, if you're going to be in that family, participate in the family, contribute to the family, throw the trash, do some dishes, do the laundry, close the door, turn off the light, put up the dog, pick up the poop. We all got it. We're in it together, amen? You know, one of the things that when we went up to that conference and Nicky Cruz was going to be speaking to us, and I didn't exactly know where he was going to come from, I just knew that he was going to talk in the supernatural. I knew he was. How do I know that? Because me and the brothers were driving down the highway. We were in San Bernardino. We were in San Bernardino. You have anybody that knows about the 10, when you're coming from San Bernardino, you need to go under a major highway system, the 15, come on, and, and then you're getting into Ontario, there's a major mall, there's a mountain called Mount Baldy, come on, there's signs everywhere that say rent a car return, airport, I mean all these obvious indications that you're around the Ontario Convention Center. And we're driving, there's three of us in the car, two young minds and one old mind, and we're jamming through, and all of a sudden, we're in, we, we haven't hit the 15, but next thing I know, I look up and I see Baldwin Park exit. You gotta recognize, Baldwin Park's about another 20 mile, or 20 minutes down the road. And I'm saying, how did we get here, guys? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> And I'm like, you don't just get here from San Bernardino to Baldwin Park without seeing all these other things. How did we get here? I don't know. I didn't see nothing. You didn't see that mountain? No. You didn't see that bridge? No. You didn't see that? I didn't see it either. What happened? When we walked into the conference, I said, Pastor Albert, I just went through a time warp, bro. I was in San Bernardino, found myself in Baldwin Park. I don't know how we got there. 
He said, that's called all Alzheimer's. <laughs> I said, well, okay, if I was alone in the car, I would go for it. <laughs> but what happened to them two young guys? Did they get some Alzheimer's? Yeah. What happened? But it was an indication. I knew God was telling me, you're about ready to walk into a service. You better get prepared. You better tune into the supernatural. So I said, okay, I'm ready. I know Supernatural was zoned in. She was Supernatural. And Nicky Cruz started to go and it looked like he pushed his notes away. And then he started talking and he said this. And he started crying. And he said, I don't care who you think you are. I don't care how high you think you rose up. I don't care where you think your station in life is now. You better treat people right. So that's all God cares about in your Christianity is how you treat people. And I said, oh man, thank you Holy Spirit. Because that's what we're talking about here in this church. Yeah. We're talking about, so you can, you can know all the words to the songs. And you can know how to dance like David. And you can know uh, Bible principles and everything like that. But if you see people funky, you ain't a Christian. You don't want to be Christian. You're in the process of becoming a Christian. But you're not a fully dead Christian yet because you're still stuck on you, who you are and how you're received. How you're preceded. Well, look at me, I don't smoke no more. So but if you don't smoke, but you treat your brother like he ain't about nothing, you ain't a, you ain't you ain't got very far yet. You're still a stuck, you're still in pampers, man. You're still stinky. What am I saying? What I'm saying is it is a time in the church where people quit trying to get up higher on a pedestal where somebody can believe that they're a Christian and just start being a Christian by treating people right. Because when, Jay asked, when they asked Jesus, what is the big commandment? And he said like this, love each other. He said the rest is a bunch of yakety. It's a bunch of content. It's a bunch of yakety yak. When you start saying, hey, you cool? Have you ate? You guys covered? Kids got diapers? You need some gas? You know, come over here flashing some big old diamond can pin with diamonds on it. And you walk right by a sister in the church who ain't got no gas. If you want to be a big shot to the band, but to the real ones that are around you, you ain't got nothing to learn from them. It's like a silly game. I'm going to tell you, it is a silly game. It's called religion. And you know who hated it? Jesus hated it. Jesus hated it. Jesus said, that's why I don't hang out with them guys. He said, because they're a bunch of fakes. He said, I hang out with these guys. Why? Because they're legit. They're really hurting. They're really in trouble. They're really without a job. They really don't have a car. They're really homeless. They really, their family really is broke up. They're really on an ankle bracelet. They're trying to get out of the joint. They're trying to get off paper. They're trying to get off drugs. They're trying to get off alcohol. They're trying to get their life together. They're, they're not acting like they're all together. They're, they're going to war life. Their family really is busted up. Jesus was this instruction. This is New Testament. I'm not taking you into the Old Testament. I'm here in the New Testament. First Timothy. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame anyone who does not provide for their own relatives. Come on, you know you're crazy, Uncle Fulano. You hide when he's coming. I don't want him here. He's going to throw one on my rug. He's going to break my lamp. He's going to want money. He's going to want to sleep in my car in the backyard. Come on. And especially for your own household. Don't tell me you're cutting your kids loose. Don't tell me that. That jacks me up. That jacks me up. Why? Because who do they have other than you? 
You know who's going to have him? The gang. Him. They're going to go, hey, don't worry about it. I love you. Come over here. I may beat you every night. You may have to go sell your body to make me money, but you can always come home. You don't understand, they're complicated. And you weren't? Okay, okay, I'll get the picture. It says, a person who does it has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60. Well, I'm 45 and I'm a widow. Get a job. <laughs> Clean someone's house, at least cook, do laundry, babysit. Has been faithful to her husband. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you. We come from a promiscuous society. Can you say that? Almost every woman I've ever met in my life, I won't even say, I'm going to say this. Almost, stay safe. Almost every woman I've ever met in my life had dogged her own man. We're going to open up a confessional booth over here on the side after service. It ain't like, it, it, they stood there and they looked at it and they go, you did it to me, I'm doing it to you. Come on. My mom and my dad, I think they got married when there was a covered wagon or something. <laughs> I mean, they raised, what, seven kids. I was in my 20s. Came from doing, you know, I was at the vacation farm over there. I came home and I was like, Where's my dad? And who's that dude sitting in the front room? That's Palomino. I was like, I'm about to go stick him. What's he doing in my house? This is his house now. You're the guest. Hello, somebody. How many of you know tables can turn? My heart went rip. I never knew. I never knew divorce. I thought divorce was from your family, not mine. And all of a sudden, the video it was right there in the house. This is part of the, our human experience. It says, if she was faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of other, of the Lord's people. And you know, ain't that you wash no one's feet, so don't even try. A different culture, a different time. Women used to wash the visitors' feet, the travelers' feet. They wore sandals. They came in. Their feet were all dirty. You'd throw a pan right there and wash their feet when you were greeting them. And they knew you were supposed to do it, and you did it. It was part of hospitality. We don't do that no more. Now we go, get a un soda, get a Pepsi, or get it. Come on. We give them a refreshing. Want some ice water? You know, we refresh them that way, we don't wash their feet. But that's what they're saying. They're saying, your home was open to the traveler, your home was open to other people, you were willing to uh, bear the burdens of other folks. Helping those in trouble, come on, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. It's not just because situation, but it's also because of the behavior of that person. We have some women that are pretty heavy in our church. We have women that are intercessors. When the men are having uh, a breakfast, who do you think's back there getting all the burritos ready? And, and the meals and everything. Who do you think's gonna 
I mean, they cater to us like they're our mamas. And they make us feel at home. Even the guy, we can pick up a guy at the 7-Eleven and bring him with us. They're going to treat him just as nice as they're going to treat anybody. And the younger women are supposed to be next to their side learning how to do it. And a lot of times, they don't get the picture yet. And you are seeing young women. You're seeing youth women, youth serving the table. You're yes. seeing youth women stepping up to the plate. Young, young women starting to get involved in the marriages, and they're being examples to the other youth. But sometimes you tell a youth, you go, hey, could you pick that up and go throw it in the trash? And they go, I ain't touching that. You're like, what? You're going to be touching more. You're going to be touching some messed up diapers when you get married. You're going to be touching your old man's funky socks and he gets home from work and come up. You're going to be touching this. Pick that up with the road, please. The example is laid by the older women. That's why they're so critical to the formula. They are representatives of how to do things right. They carry their self with dignity. They carry their self with a certain kind of Authority. They're not afraid to tell young people how to handle their business. They're not afraid to step into a situation and give advice. They know that they're needed. They know that they're very valuable to us. I don't care what age you are, woman, you're valuable to us. If you're a little, little mini one, you're valuable to us. We still want to impress you. How many of you know men love to impress women? That's why we comb our face every day. We don't comb it for the guys. We don't care what the guys say. Guys don't really want us to look cute. They wish we were ugly. And we can get our face ready for women. Right, guys? That's why guys wear that sweet smelling perfume for women. I mean, alone. For women. That's why guys wear pink shirts and purple shirts for women. We don't wear guys. All the guys laugh at you when you walk into church with your pink shirt and go, They got you, sucker. Tell them. We laugh. We go. You come in with your little earring, we go, They got you, sucker. Come in with your little skinny tight jeans. You know. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really getting them out of size eight in the women's department and stuck it in the men's stuff. And some girl said, That looks cute. And you put it on. <laughs> I got you, sir. You got glitter on your pants? I got you, sir. Come on. I know I'm right. <laughs> we got a we got a preacher down the road that he says that. I know I'm right. <laughs> I love it when he says that. Mm. Other people, people. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first law pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. Not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies. They talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to do or not ought to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give them opportunity, uh, give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have a, a 
fact, already turned away to follow Satan. A lot of times, them are the women that walk in the church and snatch dudes out of the world. They don't really want to know man. They have a house. They have their furniture. They have clothes. They have food source. They're the boss of their little castle. They just want a thing. They just want a flame. They walk in, they catch a wounded man that's barely recovering. He's all bandaged up, he's all messed up. And they snag him. And when the rest of you women just watch him do that, that ain't cool. You should be doing them like my wife did, did that lady in the street. You should be thumping them on the back of the head and saying, hey, knock it off. That ain't what we're here for. And leave that guy alone because when he's in the penitentiary, then what? When he's OD, when the cops are beating him in an alley somewhere, kicking his face up, just because you wanted a little flame. Knock it off, back off. Women have a lot of power. Women have the power to change a culture. See it all around. Guys don't dress like chicks because they thought it up. They dress like that because other chicks said it was cute. And they want to be cute to the chicks. Women have so much safe. They have a powerful, loud voice. When they start talking right. the affairs of the church. Well, are worthy of double on what we were making. I want to think about a mother's role and responsibility. You never get off duty. You're on duty 24-7. You're on duty you're directing children, you're meeting their needs, you're always supervising, you're always giving commentary on their behavior. I always tell mothers, don't try and be your kids' friends. You're not their friends. They have friends. Who could agree with all their nonsense? You gotta stand the role of a mother, you gotta do good direction, godly direction. <laughs> Women got to, mothers got to teach their daughters how to respect their own man so their own man can have some dignity and energy to face the troubles that he has to face. I see my grandson, he came stomping through the room one day and he had on a high heel. <laughs> And all the women start laughing. Oh, how cute, how cute. I said, that ain't cute. Don't tell him that's cute. He said, that ain't cute. Take that off, boy. Go put on a cowboy boot. Get out of that high heel. He's like, I'm getting two messages here. She's saying it's cute, and you're saying it's not. But I like her better than you. Come on, she feeds me. So a woman has a lot of say so. You're trying to be your kid's friend, you're, you're, you're blurring lines, you're messing up the lines. You're not their friend, you're their mama. You gotta look him in the eye, you gotta say, knock it off, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. You gotta, you gotta be tough sometimes. You gotta say things to me, it's time I'll always love you. You gotta let them know you are the most handsome guy i ever seen in my life. When you walk in the room, Brighten up the place. And he's all failed. <laughs> and it don't matter. You just gave him some ammo, man. He's ready to take on the world. You put things in the heart of man. You put things in the heart of young men and young boys that will carry them into the future. I always felt special because I know I was special to my mom. I was a burglar, 
and a robber and a thief and a liar and she would still trust me to get in her purse. How many of you know I never stole from my mom? Why? Because she rose the bar up for me higher. She said, you, get in my purse. You're the one I trust. And I was like, trust me? I'm a drug addict. No one's supposed to trust me. But my mama did. And I would have to become a man of honor when I handled her business. I got a text with a picture of a young lady in our community when I was over there at the Men of Valor. You know what she texted me? And you know what the picture was about? She said, Pastor John, they gave me the keys to the church. I went to claim the church. You know why she did that to me? Said that to me? Because she remembered when I told the story when my pastor gave me the keys to the church and sent me to clean it. And I sat there and I go, do I call the fellas and tell them come and clean out all the PA equipment? Because I was a burden. Like, this is a good opportunity to make some money. And then I said, no, I don't do that no more. I'm going to clean the church. And I sat there and I cried. And I said, Dad, you trusted me with the keys to your house. I'm going to do like I did my mom's purse. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor you. And here, all these years later, there I am over there in California, and that lady sends me a picture of herself showing me the key. Like, I'm a thug chick too, and look at it. They gave me the keys. That's what God is doing in my life. You see, we're in progression. We're in progression. These guys that you see coming up here, they're struggling, they're having battles. But one day they're going to be leading the charge. They're going to be leading congregations. They're going to be leading other men. They're going to be leading other cities, other nations, training centers. You just don't know exactly what God is going to do in their life because it's not our plan, it's God's plan. But they have to come around people like us to see that God uses ordinary people, that He uses people that have uh, tainted backgrounds. And he uses people that have a lot of scars on their heart and scars in their mind and memories that they don't even want to. It'd be so easy just to act like, I don't know nothing about none of that. I'm a college graduate and I'm from Bible college. And I'm a seminar student. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. This evening I just came here to inform you a little bit about the Word of God, just specifically in these areas of, you know. But I don't do that because I say, I can get away with that, but I don't do that because I say, you know what, you need to know that people just like you, yes. God can raise you up. Yes. God can turn your life around. God can revive you. He can take you around the world. He can do things in your life. I want to ask all the mothers. And I like, I like what Brother Rudy said because he's sensitive to the fact that we have men that have to take the role of the mother sometimes. crazy, but when you see somebody going, Happy Mother's Day, Brother Pete. Uh -huh. Happy, you know what I mean? When you see that, you go, I didn't do that. I How many of you know, man, sometimes we got to step up to the plate because it's the family. Amen? Wow. It's the family. That's what we're part of. We're part of a family. I tell the guys in the home all the time, when the brother comes knocking, I don't care if he walked out that door slapping you upside the head with his Bible. When he comes back, he's your family. You open that door. Why? He has somewhere else to go, even to win there. You're his last resort. If you don't open that door, what's going to happen? We're a family. We're a family. Come on, say it to the person next to you. We're a family. But I want all of the mothers to come up. If you have a mother, I want you to come up. You know, I mean, without mothers, there ain't no life. Without mothers, we don't have nobody, none of us to be on earth. You may be mad at your mother. Your mother may have passed away. Your mother may have left to another family. This situation got too hard for 
mother may have had to deal with a mental illness cause her to make bad decisions. But without her, you would never be here in this world. Mothers are the gateway into life. There's no life without mothers. God takes men, but He gave women a special role. They bring life into this earth. This is a Thank you. 